We don't even, we never plan this stuff. It just uh, all kind of flows yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, like, really oh, well. What we say to each other cannot be divisive. Gosh, I just think that when we get so focused on walking the line and just we miss so much of God's creativity. We actually, we only created the odd show to have this conversation. Right. We're going to say some bad things about stuff. If you're not bad huge, things, like, if you're a huge Toby Mac, turn it off now. For, for people who are struggling with why would a God of the universe care about me individually, you are his favorite. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is The Odd Show. Let's get right into it. Here's your hosts, Bruce Bugano and Thomas Hogan. Hey, welcome to The Odd Show. Um, we're back. This is, I think, the first time all four of us are going to be on the show. On the show. And the do, the, do the thing. Yep. So if you're not familiar, actually, both our wives have been on the show before, just their own episode. Um, second most popular <clears throat> episode, some, second some may popular. say. Second so, most popular. Depending on how you count. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, I'm Bruce. This is Thomas. This is my wife, Sarah. And this is my wife, Angie. Then I'll talk. <laughs> oh, we talk. <laughs> um, we, they wait until they're spoken to, I think, for the most part. Oh, you don't keep um, because we believe in umbrella theology, if you've <laughs> not heard our... We're teaching a lot of umbrella theology these days. If you've not heard that episode. So um, you guys believe in that, we don't, so then what? You, oh, dang. you, you submit. submit. Yeah, Ephesians, Ephesians 5.21 says submit. Actually, it's 5.22. It says submit to your husbands. So. As they submit to Christ. Well, yeah. I'm submitted to Christ. I'm so, Yeah. That, okay. Of course. Okay, this is not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> that is not right. what we're here to talk this about. This is not what we're here to talk about. Um, we're actually going to talk about... Um, and you uh, should clarify that that's not actually... That's what not what we believe. Watch well, no, the you don't. They, they have to watch the episode. Yeah. They, maybe we do well, believe that. Watch the episode. Plug add a link. Uh, yeah, yeah. There'll be a link. <laughs> Umbrella theology is the thing. It's important. Um, and we have a whole episode on it. Yeah, we did it at the Boise... Or at the uh, Canyon Co-op. County Co-op. Yeah. yeah, we did. It was a good time. Anyway, um, so we are going to talk about something that we've been kind of talking about all separately, um, but we're going to talk about... And it's floating around the church a lot right now, too. So. Yeah, it is. Actually, um, by the time this airs, it will probably have been a couple months, um, but when we're recording this, uh, there's a pastor out of California, um, I wasn't even familiar with him, who just committed suicide, mm-hmm. um, and we're really sorry um, that, you know... Praying, prayers go out, praying for his family and just pastors in general. Um, and so we'll talk about that, but we're going to talk about um, counseling or counsel versus counseling. And we've talked about it a little bit, Thomas and I, um, and kind of when I introduced this idea to Thomas when we were show planning, I wanted to talk about like premarital counseling versus premarital counsel. Um, and really, it's a bigger issue than that. Um, but I think that's just where it starts. That's a good so, jumping off point. Yeah, so um, the only time that, in the past anyway, that it's been really acceptable to get counseling in the church um, was is premarital counseling. Premarital counseling. We're all about... Is the pre- one exposure to actual counseling, counseling um, that churches uh, promote. Which is funny, because any counseling after that, what's the... What, what's a common, like, depression or anxiety or, like, what's a common um, stance on that as far as, like, if you struggle with a, a mental health issue? Oh, what's the you, church did, you don't have enough faith. What, yeah. Yeah. That your spiritual warfare. Yeah, it's, it's, it's spiritual issue. warfare. It's faith issue. It's it's weakness. It's Demonic. Um, yeah, demonic. Allowing the enemy to mm-hmm. feed right. you lies. Don't say you're depressed or then the the devil will control yeah. you and actually make you depressed. Right. Oh, you speak the words. Yeah, right. you oh. say it out loud and right. then it's true. So, um, which is how I got the flu seven times. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> I was like, I think I got the flu. Oh, that's <laughs> because you believe in Texas. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I got the flu. That's because the military makes you get the flu shot. Yeah. Um, uh, that's it. <laughs> Jim Gaffigan, you guys know Jim Gaffigan? He's yeah. like, you can't even talk about can- cancer because the devil will be like, oh, you're talking about cancer? You have cancer. Bam. He's like, he's like, and then we whisper it like, 
cancer. Oh, you're trying to hide the fact that, that you're talking about cancer from the devil? You got cancer two times. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> two um, different kinds of cancer. So, uh, but yeah, I think that's, that is the general take from a, lot, the, a large portion of evangelicalism. So let me ask this then. Why is premarital counseling okay and other forms of counseling have not been okay? That is a good question. Maybe because premarital counseling is viewed as like because the pre maintenance, because you can see the symptoms of a bad marriage, but you can't see the symptoms of a mental disorder a lot. They're mm -hmm. it's invisible versus very visible. That's good. Um, do you think it has anything to do with just trying to establish a foundational um, like church root in people's lives, mm -hmm. like early, early on? So that they don't, so that they, they see that as a normal pattern. Like, I'm going to go to the pastor if I have a problem. I'm going to go to the pastor if I have an issue because he helped us out whenever we were starting out in the, this kind of huge life transition that you have, you know, in, the, in your early 20s or you know, whenever you get married. Um, and it's kind of a way for the church to kind of really reinforce its, um, I want to say authority, influence in your life. Not in a bad way. I don't want to say no. Because I, I mean, I, I think that that has, I think that plays a role. So so because it's a, it's acceptable, right? And it's also you're coming to me as an authority. I think I don't know. I, I think you, it, premarital counseling is kind of like you're coming to this person as an authority to guide and um, direct this next portion of your life. Right. Right. So so my frustration with that is is you're telling a, a married couple that counseling is okay. In the beginning, before they get married, like, hey, count, you need premarital counseling. Not only is it okay, it's essential right. if you're going to be successful well, as a married couple. And these and days, then, a requirement before the pastor will marry. Some married. pastors, yeah. Some right. pastors won't even marry somebody until um, they But then after sessions. they get married, the idea of counseling is, like, inside the church, we're okay saying, oh, you're arguing constantly, or you've committed adultery, or whatever. Go get marriage counseling. Um, but we're not okay with, oh, you're struggling with depression? Mm -hmm. Go get counseling. So, like, we set this precedent at the beginning, at the front end, and then we get to pick and choose afterwards right. what's counseling worthy and what's demonic influence or the attack of the enemy. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. that's my frustration with it. And I think it actually goes even deeper than that. I think there's confusion in the church. Who are you reading it? So, well, I was going to say something to, to that effect. What I was going to say was premarital counseling is, is um, dealing with issues before they're an issue. So it's, it's easy and it's clean and it's not messy. And once you have all these monumental issues, that's a lot of... You have kids, you have postpartum stuff depression, you have... That right. you, you, you lose your job, all that stuff else. happens. So... Yes, and, and that's kind of where I'm like, I think that it's this bigger thing where, one, they confuse counseling with counsel. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I'd be better with them calling, because there's no existing issues, I'd be better with, I'd feel better about it being called premarital counsel, where we're going to give you wisdom, we're going to provide wisdom about areas that are common struggles within marriage so that you're more prepared going into marriage. That's not counseling. That's counsel. That's teaching. That's a provision of wisdom and a sharing of knowledge, right? Which, all, oh, by the way, that should be a part of everybody's life. Not, right. oh, you're 23 and you're going to marry this young girl. Let's sit down and have a talk about marriage and in in, in the future. Right. Maybe at 15. Or 13 or 11, you start explaining, hey, life is important and making these decisions matters. And here's a, here's a pattern that, that yeah. works for us. Right. So having that constant conversation might be more uh, beneficial than waiting, or, than, than putting it on people at the time they make that decision. And I think, right. And I think that's continual counsel. And I think, like what you said, Angie, like where um, the hard stuff, like when real life starts happening and you're like depression and postpartum depression and just any, any mental health issues come up. Um, most pastors, I feel like, 
most inside the church, not just pastors, but most inside the church, have kind of abdicated their ability to provide counsel in the things that the church can provide wisdom in and understand the difference between those things and things that require professional help, like people that are equipped with tools that are not just, we're going to you know pray the demon out, but no, it's not demonic. I like it's a it's literally a chemical imbalance in my brain that God can heal, but that He's also gifted other people to to help in that healing, right? Right. So I think there are things. So like, and and I'll just put this out there for you guys: when um, a young couple married two or three years, the the honeymoon phase is kind of wearing off, and they're like, oh. I really don't like that you throw your clothes on the floor when you walk in the room. And I don't like that you don't do the dishes. And I don't like, and all of a sudden these little things start coming up where they're like, man, this is hard. And they're arguing and they go to the pastor and they're like, like we're, we argue constantly and he's doing this crap and she's doing this junk. And the pastor's like, oh, you clearly need counseling. I think that that's wrong. Like, I think that's a wrong statement. I think that, that what, what they need is counsel. Like what they need is the pastor to say, oh, of course you don't know how to be married because you've only been married for two years. But John and Louise, they've been married for 40 years and they know how to go through that. So I'm going to connect you with them and you're going to spend some time, yeah. a, a, you know, a night every week with them for the next however long it takes for you to understand how to talk to each other. Um, so we don't want to address those issues, you know what I'm saying? Like, we don't want to handle those issues inside the church. We automatically want to be like, oh, premarital? I mean, you need you need marriage counseling because you're a mess. But then someone comes and says, I'm struggling with depression. And they're like, honey, you just ain't got enough faith. And they won't recommend counseling, and they want to, like, put you on a prayer list. Um, thoughts on that? Like, Well, put them on a prayer list, that's fine. But, but maybe provide them with some avenues. Um, we went to a church in Florida, and they had an on-staff. They had two on-staff, but a, an on-staff um, counselors or counselor uh, that they would refer people to if it, if it was major issues. My, my kid went through some serious stuff for a while and went to go visit with him, um, and it was really beneficial. So I, I feel like, yeah, there, there should be a place in the church where we, we're just connected to this network of people that and he provided christian counseling but there's other things out there um to, to meet the need but depending on what it is like if it's anxiety depression suicidal thoughts whatever it is um that there's there should be an avenue beyond yes i'm all for praying for people you should pray right. for people and put them on a prayer list whatever that means but um provide them with more than provide them with hope that's what we should be doing Right. And, and hope isn't, I'm going to pray for you. Hope is, I'm going to pray for you, and here's some, here's some things that might help. Right. So, both of you guys have been pretty open with just mental health struggles that you... So, do either one of you want to share, like, that, like, what that Has does... Has the church enabled or, like, or what that does disabled your ability inside to the church. connect to that? Whew. Okay, so... I think a huge part of the problem is the way the church perceives what mental um, mental illness is to begin with, period. Um, and even things like uh, behavioral things. So um, our son Ruben has autism, and he was at a youth group um, last year, and they were talking about... Um, in the area we lived in, it was the the number three state in in the U.S. for um, statistically for um, teenage suicide within. Um, what state was it? Utah. Utah. Oh, Utah. Yeah. So uh, we there had been lots of young young teenagers committing suicide. So they were tackling this um, during youth group, and it was a pretty heavy conversation. And they were talking about depression and anxiety and how um, those things are from the enemy. And, um, you know, the way they were presenting it 
was kind of like, it, it's a faith issue. And then a young man said, well, what about autism? And from the pulpit, this youth pastor said, yeah, that's demonic. Like, that's, that's not what God wants for you. And the look on this little boy's face, he has Asperger's. He knew Ruben had autism. They looked at each other. And then they both turned around and looked at me. And I was so full of sadness and rage. Like, I wanted to go up to the stage and just shake him and be like, how dare you? That's so irresponsible to make a statement like that to these young, impressionable kids. And um, Thomas and I actually pulled them aside after and talked to them and affirmed them and encouraged them and told them that we didn't think that that was correct and um, encouraged this other young man to go and talk to his parents about what had happened. He has really awesome parents. But it made me so sad that something like that was said. And I think um, that is, by and large, that is what church is, what their stance is with, when it comes to things like that. I remember being a young 20 year old in Minot, North Dakota, and a lot of the ladies gathered and did a book study on um, anxiety and depression. The pastor's wife led it. And she, in, and the, the, basically the whole gist of this book study was that you aren't, um, you aren't drawing in enough and allowing Christ to draw, to draw you to him. So enough. you're not drawing close enough to Christ yes. for him to draw you. That close was enough. so sad wow. to me. It was so sad. And I looked around the room and I remember looking at all of these women who were just hopeless. Like, man, I, I thought I did love Jesus. And well, I, I, no I guess I don't, I guess I don't, I guess I'm not at the place where, you know, I, I thought I was trusting God and it, it just, it's so irresponsible, but I think that's a, that is a huge issue right. is our person in the church, the perception of what mental illness is. And, and you grew up in struggling with that. Not, right. You did. So I had deeper, I, I have experienced a mental disorder called depersonalization since I was about 12 years old. And um, I didn't actually know what it was until about a year ago. And I can't remember ever, and I'm not going to go into it. You could Google depersonalization if you want to learn about it. Um, it's under the heading of anxiety. Um, I never, I can't remember any specific teachings that I sat under or that I heard that said anxiety and depression is demonic or whatever. I might have blocked it out. I might have been too young. I might, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, or it wasn't a topic like when I was in Bible school. But I, I know for sure that the conclusion I came to between the ages of 12 and 32 were that what I was experiencing was demonic and that it all came down to spiritual warfare. And every time I had an episode that could last from two to 17 minutes and for some people drives them to suicide, I would pray in tongues and rebuke, you know, rebuke the darkness and bind the enemy and declare the name of Jesus over myself because I didn't know that it was in my mind and when nothing happened when it didn't affect anything I thought well this whole teaching about having authority in the spiritual realm is bogus because obviously or I'm lacking in some essential area because mm -hmm. I'm rebuking whatever demonic presence I feel taking over my mind and it's not doing anything different and it wasn't until I reached out explained my symptoms and asked someone if they knew what it was that I was able to take the step towards um, getting actual help through counseling with a counselor who was trained and had experience with depersonalization and was mm -hmm. able to walk me through that. And now it's a matter of if or when I have depersonalization episodes, just 
clinging to Jesus, like, get me through this, get me through this, get me through this. And I don't have to strive or battle. I just have to um, rely on him for my strength. So it's a merging of my faith, my, my relationship with Father God, and what I've learned through counseling that has helped me overcome depersonalization. So you were given tools. And yeah. faith. Tools and faith. And faith. Right. And I already had the faith. Right. Yeah. Right. I was right. given tools to complement my faith, and together it was the cure, or at least and a And your very... counselor is a Christian counselor. Yeah, yes. And I think, I think you know, if, if we were in the 1700s or something, and we didn't have an understanding of... Uh, anxiety disorders. We didn't have an understanding of the, of the human mind. <laughs> if we didn't have psycho psychoanalysis that, that has been highly, highly developed and taught uh, and taught and studied, and and it's just science. There's a science to psychology. Um, that I, I get that if you don't know the answer, then just the answer should be trust Jesus. I don't. Yeah. If you don't know the answer to right. something, that's a good answer. Trust but, God. But you should preface that with. I don't know. But yeah, yeah. You should <laughs> trust God. Yeah, you should trust God because we don't know what to, how to fix this. But once you figure out how to fix something, if I know that giving you, if I know that, you know, you getting gangrene and the best way, I, the best thing I can think of is to cut off your arm. The, the, but maybe just a shot would, would keep you from dying from gangrene and I don't have to cut <laughs> off your arm. Maybe we go send you to somebody who will give you the shot. And not just go, go straight to cutting off the arm. And we don't say we don't know how to fix things. Mm. There are some issues that I think that the church are not experts in. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like right. You're it's not, okay. You're, you're, at your job as a pastor or as an uh, evangelist or missionary or whatever it is, your job is not to have all the answers all the time. Well, and, and especially as a pastor, like one of the best things you can do, like if you're a pastor and your job is to care for people's hearts, because let's be honest, most pastors today are really teachers. Because I've heard a lot say, uh, <laughs> "I don't, you know, like I, I don't do well with people. I'm in my sweet spot on the stage." And you're not a pastor, like, like biblically, you're not a shepherd. Right. You're, you're a teacher. Embrace that. Maybe you're an apostle. Maybe you're, you're an, apostle, an apostle at that level, or an evangelist, or apostle-ish. But if you're a shepherd, one of the most caring things you can do for a person's heart is point them in the direction that gets them the help they need. Right. right. Right? There was one time when I was, so when I was in Bible school, I remember working at a coffee shop, and this drunk man came in, and he was sitting in one of the chairs, and he was just, like, hammered, so beyond his ability to function. And he was sitting in his chair, and he was, he couldn't even sit still. And in, I'm 19 years old, maybe, and I just go over to him with all the compassion in my heart and all the naivety that I carried around with me and started like preaching to him and like telling him how much he loves Jesus and or how much Jesus loves him and how much he needs Jesus to overcome this. And a lady came up to me and she told me to be quiet and she said, he does not need Jesus. He needs help. And it was like, the doors of revelation were flung wide open. And I realized in that moment, it's something that's always stick with me, stuck with me, that absolutely the power of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, when we are cleansed in the blood of Jesus, it helps so much. But that man needed Jesus and help. He did not need to sit on the sidewalk completely drunk out of his mind and have some teenager preaching at him he needed help and it's the same way with mental disorders like you need jesus and counseling right. mm -hmm. and we talked about this the other day and I, I fully believe like i'm more and more i'm convinced like counseling outside of christianity like if you're not christian and you go to counseling they're mostly like counseling is going to give you the tools to to cope and manage like it's pain management it's like going to the doctor and you're like my arm is killing me and they and they're trying to figure out what's wrong with it um, to make it whole and healed but they give you meds to to 
manage the pain, to help stop some of the pain. And then you do physical therapy as a means for, for coping with that and strengthening it. Um, that's counseling. Christ gives full wholeness. Christ mm -hmm. gives complete healing. So you might manage and cope and feel healed enough to, to cope for the rest of your life. But there's a reason why some people are in counseling for 30 years. Like, at some point, yeah. you should be able to function, um, whether it's with pharmacology or with, you know, continued counseling. Um, and that's not to say, because, like, we all know people who had cancer, and we prayed and prayed and prayed, and they died. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, trust we, God. We need Jesus. Like, yeah, trust God. Um, that doesn't mean God's not good. That just means our world's broken. Um, so there will be those people that need to be on medication because of de for depression forever. Forever. Mm -hmm. And that need to be in counseling forever. And they have Jesus. And they feel a wholeness. But they're still going to need to manage that thing that's going on in them. You know? So um, I, I think that there's, there's another piece to this, though, that if I, if I found out if I were to find out that someone were on, say, depression medication, right, anti-anxiety medication, whatever, would you – now, I, I know what, how I would feel about it, but would you say that the average Christian would be okay with having that person have authority, have influence in their lives? Because I think that's where the scare is. Right. Especially, I don't know about this pastor specifically, but I know a lot of people that are in leadership that would never admit – they wouldn't admit their struggles, much less how they're coping with their struggles right. and, the, and the things that they're doing to, to manage it. And so that's where I think that the church, just by never having this conversation or pushing it off to the side or saying, well, I just trust God, I have faith, I, I think that it's a, it's a cop-out in a lot of ways. Like, right. yeah, you should have trust God and you should have faith, but um, maybe you need some, some Xanax too. I would argue that recognizing your need for medication makes you more healthy because at least you're not in denial. Right. Of, but I'm just saying how the average Christian right. might how take right. 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 I, don't I don't want to take leadership. That's me personally. I remember right. whenever my wife first started, I forget what it was. It was in maybe the end of our stay in Minot and beginning of our time in Texas. Um, Texas. But I remember my wife, because we've been, you know, youth pastors and student teachers and, and young adult leaders and all that stuff. And I remember my wife whenever she first started taking medication, and yeah, she was my brother passed. Him, yeah, so. and and yeah, she was out, she was going through depression, and and she started taking medication, and she was like, "What?" She didn't want to take the medication. Basically, she had the medication, didn't want to take it, and she was like, "What are people going to think if they know that I didn't just trust God through this? Like, I didn't just allow the Holy Spirit to to heal me and make it okay." And, uh, and that was a long, hard season of our lives. There was so much. Sh I felt so shamed. In did you feel shame internally that wasn't actually there? Or did people shame you? Both. It was both. Oh, okay. It was definitely both. Because I had been through some um, book studies and Bible studies and prayer sessions with women who I loved and respected and um, really thought that they had wise counsel who... Um, made me feel, and, and I mean, they were very outright with it. It almost made me feel like I was praying to get well and it wasn't happening. So maybe my prayers weren't being heard. Mm. Maybe I wasn't worthy of a healing. Mm. And so my brother passed away in 07 and there was probably like a two and a half year period that there's a lot of fuzziness and blur there because I was in such a deep state of grieving. It consumed me. And then the depression and then the anxiety. So it was like this trifecta of awful. Mm. And I remember feeling so inadequate as a Christian because I was like at the bottom of the barrel, like, okay, well, what's left? Because I... I thought I did the thing that I was supposed to do, which was lay it at the foot of Jesus. And I'm not getting the results that I think I'm supposed to be getting. So last ditch effort, let's do meds because apparently I suck at this Christian thing. Right. 
that is really, I really, really felt that way. And it makes me so sad now as an adult and um, having, we have had children who, we have children who have struggled with anxiety and depression at different points. And um, that really has prepared me for the way I love people who are in those situations. But I mean, and that gets to like, yeah, like who wants to trust a guy who can't even trust God? Like, yeah, like, who's going to take advice from a guy that's got to be on a pill? Um, Carlos Whitaker, you know, Carlos Whitaker is, um, yes, you do. You've, he's a musician. He was a worship leader out in um, Nashville, hangs out with Pete Wilson, pastor. Anyway. Anyway, he's been over years and years and years, um, long time ago, did the, like, one of the first encounters is sits down with some homeless dude, plays a guitar. Oh, that guy. You, I like that guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that guy's great. Um, anyway. A he's, rag, he's a rag muffin, I believe. Yeah. Yep. Um, and he has been very vocal about the fact that he's on uh, antidepressants. He's mm -hmm. taking meds. And I would, I would argue right. that musicians typically are um, emotional people. Right. And mm. prone to um, a bout of uh, a ma mania. L uh, Joey Spencer. Um, in, in, in intense highs and, and low lows. Right. No, absolutely. On the Enneagram. Creatives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Hyper, yeah. hyper creatives are also. Sarah typically. really wants to do an episode on Enneagram. Yes, hyper I do. everything. Um, <laughs> I have to learn a little more first. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, like on bad, on the Bad Christian podcast, Joey Spencer is a pastor at Seacoast Church, which is a huge, it's a mega church. Um, and he's a campus pastor, and he's very vocal about the fact that he's on antidepressants. So I think that there are people trying there to is a turn. erase there is a turn. stigma, yeah. get rid of it, but it doesn't undo the fact that that's been a stigma. So, mm -hmm. I mean, pastors already feel like they can't connect, um, which I have a whole other issue, other issue with that. <laughs> but pastors already feel like they can't connect with, you know, if they knew my dirt. And now, you're getting, now you want me to tell them all my antidepressants and I'm coming up here and telling them everything's fine every Sunday morning? You're crazy. Like, that's yeah, not going to happen. Yeah. Well, those are, that's a terrible thing to tell your congregation, first of all. Right. That you every, guys have made me depressed is what they should say. You came to Jesus. <laughs> now you're going to be okay. That is yeah. counter yeah. what yeah. I read. Right. And, I, and I like the Bible. quote that says, never trust a man without a limp. And I am a huge proponent of just being completely real if on stage and I struggle with depression and I take medication, I would be like, finally, a human Well, not a stage. human, but, well, an a honest real person. person. Right. <laughs> they're, 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 most, he, most of them, I mean. Not a demigod that yeah. I have to listen to every week. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if you're not well, and somebody who is trained with wisdom is offering you something that that can help you to be well, mm -hmm. why would you not It is weird do that. that, that, that it, so if, if you had and a... if your goal is to help other people into wellness, you can't do that if you're not well yourself. Right. 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 And we take vitamins for our bodies. No, if you have cancer, you're going to go get chemo. It's not the, the pastor's not going to say, I'm not. stop. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, fine. Neither of my wives are taking chemo. Okay. Right. We'll, see, we'll see what happens. When the so chips are down, says, if, everyone makes decisions with different no, decisions. No, when the I'm chips are down, I'm a more mature, better Christian now, so God is hearing my prayers. Oh, right. She did get those converse. You did get those converse. That's God, a different story. We wasted the <laughs> we wasted the good surprise. Yeah. All right. Um. Yeah. I think I think it is interesting that we're okay with Advil for a headache, but not you know right. uh, what, what makes people happy. Xanax. Yeah. Zola. Prozac. Prozac. Not, not oh, Prozac. Yeah. Not Prozac for a long afternoon. Right. You know, but we're completely okay with a little aspirin or a little, little, uh, you know. A little, little aspirin. 800 <laughs> milligrams at a pop. Like yeah. And so. Knock that sucker out. Yeah. <laughs> I need to take a nap. <laughs> um, so I just, I guess my biggest thing kind of wrapping it up is yeah, like, wine is done. yeah, that's the timer. Um, <laughs> Yes, she's drinking on camera <laughs> and on the show. <laughs> we'll have a talk. Really we'll talk about either. that some other time also. <laughs> oh, speaking of mental health. Is <laughs> um, yeah, we'll have an episode about whether or not it's okay to drink. Alcohol, alcohol dependency. <laughs> uh, um, 
But uh, I just want to wrap it up with saying, like, um, I really, like, and, and so I'm getting my degree in, in counseling. I'm going to be an LPC in, like, a year and a half. I'll be done just under a year and a half. Um, you have a degree in chaplaincy. Um, you're working, you're going to start working towards social work or whatever. You've been doing social work for a long, long time. Um, my, I, I wish, like I, my goal, my heart is to help pastors understand the difference between what requires counsel and what requires counseling and know that they're not equipped to give counseling. Right. Like some, and yeah, in some like, cases, yeah, in, in, most in, cases. in many cases, I mean, like. Even even if you go to school and you have a degree in pastoral counseling, that is still limited. Yeah. They, like like I, I remember when I was in seminary and I was getting my degree in in Christian ministry with the concentration in pastoral counseling. The most that we talked about was strategic pastoral counseling, which is limited to five sessions, and and it's for single issue counseling. So like I'm struggling with pornography. All right, we're gonna we're gonna counsel through this for the next five sessions, and then I'm gonna send you to celebrate recovery or whatever. And part of that was like you limit it because you don't want to have an affair with the with a woman, you know, whatever. Um, no, just actually, don't you have an limit, affair with the woman. You should also limit it because you're not a professional, <laughs> right? <laughs> limit it because you so, don't know what you're talking. And about. and that's the thing is, is like Tennessee will license a pastoral counselor mm -hmm. um, because it's the Bible Belt. But most other states don't license pastoral counselors. Like, you can be a pastoral counselor, but you can't be a licensed pastor and get paid for it. So, I just think the church needs to That could replace the tithe. We could, repl we could replace Medicare. Do your job. With uh, <laughs> um, I just think the church needs to... saying we should license these guys. No. It might be beneficial. Yeah. And then come up with a, a Medicare for Christians... That they paint us into, and then we'll sure why not claims. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, just came up with a really good plan, guys. Don't we have about. multiple ideas. To take <laughs> I feel like that exists already. It, it is. It's that, it's, it's that, yeah. it's that yeah. medical share, yeah, see, whatever. Yeah, you do it. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, whatever. We're just trying to do it to get rich. Um, <laughs> we so have lots care. of ideas about you know, how to take people's side. Rich yeah. Well, <laughs> I can't fit through the idea. We're we, trying to go through. We're trying to do redistribution of wealth of ties. Anyway, I just think they need to know the difference. And I think the church needs to take a serious look at like what it's capable of accomplishing and what it can. And 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 that not everything's demonic. Like they're yeah. definitely hiding behind every bush trying to make sure you don't get their parking spot. Like that's not what's happening. Um, How about pastors have some humility? Leaders. Let's put leaders. Leaders. Have some humility and be okay with not needing to be the resource for right. every problem and issue that comes along. Right. Staying in your lane and being excellent at taking spiritual, care of yeah, people's spiritual hearts. Advice and, right. And, and being okay with, you know what, this is right. This is I, I don't know how to do this. Like yeah. being okay with that. Right. And not insistent on, well, the being church has to be right. the fix for yeah. everything. And and part of that is understanding that you don't have to dump everybody off for counseling. Because there are people inside your church that can help people mm -hmm. that need counsel, like yeah, right. That need counsel. Young guy yeah. doesn't have doesn't know what he wants to do with his future and he's aimless. That guy needs counsel, right? He, he needs, needs, he needs guidance. guidance. He needs, he needs counselor. Yeah, he needs counsel from a Christian who's has their career. On but that. that would require Financial management. community, right? Real deep community again in your church right. because. That, that would mean the pastor has to know the people that he's shepherding right. and know what their gifts and their talents right. are. And right. that's a whole nother thing too. Yeah. And, and, so, and, so. and that's not put it, I don't want to make it seem like all pastors are, don't know what they're doing. There are a lot of people, a lot of leaders who get it. Who there are, are a lot like, of leaders are, that don't know what they're doing. No. There are a lot of leaders who um, will take that avenue and say, hey, I've got this guy over here. We've, we, we actually, the church pays him a, a fee every month to be able to send people to him and That's I think that I you're a good it. candidate right. yeah. and so I think that that th there are a lot of leaders that do that well mm. I think that the church as a whole probably should have this discussion because you're still seeing insane suicide rates inside the church insane the, the, I, it's not, I'm not going to attack the divorce rate the <laughs> subject insane. of divorces Period. like this this how divorces happen not even that that they happen and there's a huge it's a, equal to the world 
that's not the issue. I think that there, the the it's adultery and alcoholism, uh, alcoholism and abuse, pornography, yeah. abuse, emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, all of this stuff, and and there should be someone to say, hey, I am not equipped for this. I, as a leader in the church, I, I love God and I, and I trust God, and my marriage may be okay, but. It sounds like there's some things here that I am not capable of. I don't have the through. tools to give, and, and I want to help you guys connect you with, you know, Ben and Robin. They're amazing uh, counselors that work downtown for a, a, a firm, and they will they will get you what you need. And that's why I'm in the program that I'm in because I was count, giving counsel to people, and they'd be like, "I'm addicted to pornography," and I'm like, "I can walk through that with you, but I don't have the tools to help you heal that." Like. I don't know how to do that, mm -hmm. but I'll walk through it with you, and you can come tell me how hard it is, and I'll pray with you, but somebody, you need help. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And just know your limitations. Yeah. And be okay with it. And be honest. Be you honest. can't be, I can't be great at everything. I just don't, and there's, and the expected, there's, in the real world, nobody expects that from people. Like, right. I have parents who, who I loved before when they were still alive, and I didn't think they were perfect. I didn't right. think that they couldn't fail. I, I, they had room to fail in my life. Right. And, they, and they were honest with me. And they, they gave me room to be like, hey, we know you're not going to make every right decision. Um, we love you. And, and if you love people well, you, it gets over the fact that they're not perfect. Right. And you're like, okay, I love you. Yeah. So like, if, you're, if you've been married for any time at all, you know that your spouse isn't perfect. Maybe close, but not perfect. And, and, and the expectation for them to be perfect is actually unattainable unreasonable and it, and it will cause failure that's it will right. cause it's, it's extremely problem yeah. extreme problems so right. that require counseling. and we do that with our leaders too we think that they're above us or more than more than more than human and that's demigods yeah you just can't you're not perfect right demigods yeah so any party thoughts no okay so um Get, get help, help if you need help. <laughs> get help, you guys. Obviously, you're watching this show. You need help. Touche. Um, we're well, not counselors. Just, <laughs> we just are not. that if re the realization that you need help has no bearing on, on your faith walk. Right. Yeah. I think that that is really important. And really, maybe God is the one saying, go get help. Go get help. Like, go get help. This is, this is okay. So, all right. That's the show. Um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get like not right now but we're going to get another episode in and then the wives are going to do an episode on Ray Dunn or something they're not going to do an episode on Ray Dunn I promise you I don't, is that our country singer? Uh, yeah <laughs> I assume um, sure is it I don't know we have to do that I assume it's our country it singer um, anyway uh, I absolutely know what Ray Dunn is it's all over my house um, anyway that's the show that's an uh, we're Ray we are not doing an episode on Ray Dunn. Uh, you you can't, can mention it. You can't tell us what to do. I will delete <laughs> it. It will never get uploaded. <laughs> um, anyway, that's the show. Stay out. Stay out. Thanks for checking out The Odd Show. You can follow Bruce on Twitter at BPags2 and Thomas at BlenderZen. Remember to rate and review us on iTunes and share us with your friends. Until next time, stay odd.